SEMA is way more expensive than you might think. And the reason I say that is when it comes into setting up as an exhibitor, and we've been doing this since 2007, I would say the cost of 2007 versus today would probably be 10x of what it was back then. And that shocks a lot of people. The cost of setup between just the space, the union workers, I mean, let's face it, if we wanna put a hanging sign above our booth and they got those bucket cranes, their labor rate is almost $1,800 per hour. And you think they would prorate it on a, you know, like part of an hour because it takes them 10 minutes to put it up. Oh no, it's a one hour minimum. Whether it takes them 10 minutes or one hour, it's a full $1,800. And so when you start factoring that cost, or if you want to run electrical on your floor, just power cords that are duct taped to meet certain standards, which takes them less than 20 minutes, they charge you for four hours labor. And then if you want to load in your freight from the back door to the front door, they literally take a fork lid, your skid, and they deliver it to your booth. And it literally takes them like 10 minutes to go from one side of the hall to the other. And they charge you per pound, including the boxes and everything it's sitting in, in order to move it. So you might be spending ten dollars or $15,000. It takes them 10 minutes to move it to your booth. And when you leave, it takes them 10 minutes to move it out. Back in 2007, if you were to get a... 10 foot deep by 20 foot booth, which is what we started with. I think the space back then was roughly around 6,500 to $7,000 in 2007. And today, if you lease that same space, just the space inside the convention center, I believe it's somewhere between 12 and 15,000, depending on what hall and location that you're in. And today we operate a 20 by 30 booth, which is three times larger than our original booth. And that can run depending on the location. Is it peninsula? Is it sideline? Is it inland? Can range anywhere between twenty-five and fifty thousand dollars just for the concrete. Now you got your floor, you got your staffing, you got your promo models who take you know scan leads so we can get leads during the show. Just staffing and people to help manage it. You're probably going to spend depending on the size of your booth. I would say anywhere between ten and, and fifty thousand dollars. You know some of these booths you see at SEMA. They're, they're like houses, right? And they're half a million dollar booths just to set up. And so I wouldn't be surprised if a company like SunTech Films, which we buy PPF from, who's owned by Eastman Kodak. I heard rumors that for them to be at SEMA every year, somewhere between seven and $800,000 for four days. I would say that we average somewhere between 80 and 120 to be an exhibitor at SEMA per year. People think that we can actually sell product at the show. We can't. There's no selling product. In fact, it's prohibited. And so you're there to build relationships and be able to offer your product in different markets so that you can go to different countries. And so you're building relationships outside of the United States so you can go global, right? And sometimes some of these relationships that we meet at SEMA can take up to a year. Like I'll give you an example. We had one guy in who uh, was in Australia, in Sydney. It took us six months to put the first order together. We've had people we met at the show three years ago that just kept watching us. And then finally, after three years, came to us and said, I'm ready to pull the trigger. When can we sit down and make this happen? So, you know, you have to look at it as a long-term play. It's not a short term where you think you can monetize, go to the show and get your money out of one show. Because if you do that, it's never going to happen. And you're going to be strongly disappointed. So some of the bigger booths, our buddies of Warsteiner, I know a few years ago, they make custom wheels. Now they do Gunther Works, which is an amazing custom 911. They would spend a half million dollars for a booth. And when I talked to Peter, Peter said that he could rent two suites and throw parties every night for his potential distributors and you know resellers worldwide and just run two penthouses for like a hundred grand for the week and do the same amount of business. So he just thought, Let, let's try this. And one year he did it. And we went to one of his private parties and it was packed every night. So they're going off site to see if they can monetize quicker. And I think it's more of a personal environment than a big you know, group where you don't have the privacy, where you're in a penthouse, you can go to a private area, you can sit down at a table, you can discuss business. And not everybody's standing around waiting, hey, hey, can I talk to you? Because when we go to these shows, and because of the exposure and a lot of the ad spend that we put into promoting this and the YouTube channel and working with Vin Wiki and other people and other rallies, people want to come shake my hand. They want to talk to me. And unfortunately, it's really frustrating sometimes because you don't want to be rude, but you're there for a reason. You're spending a lot of money and that's not the place to have a conversation. Or a person wants to come into the booth and grab a, a bottle of tire gloss and says, what makes your tire gloss better than everybody else's, right? 
and you got three guys from different countries who want to talk to you about distributing your product or you know setting up a gloss university in their country and you got this guy with tire gloss so how do you diffuse that conversation so you're not rude and go to the people that matter so what we do is we teach the promo models to interview and ask five basic questions to evaluate what the person's there to talk to me about so that if they're there for something other than what we need to be there for they'll tell them hey here's a card you hit this landing site on our website and he'll be setting up a zoom call or a youtube live and he can answer a lot of your questions and so we learn it after years and years and years that you don't want to lose a hundred thousand dollar customer for a guy that wants to buy twenty dollars and he shouldn't even be in the convention he's there because somebody gave him a pass and he wants to go to booth to booth but he's not a buyer and that takes a lot of time up so we've learned over the years how to filter uh, people when they come to the booth it's success if you come away with one good relationship because if you think about it if you have one relationship say from Colombia, and that one person you build a relationship to know five other people in south america who want to be part of your group that one person just opened up five new conversations by doing business with that one person so it's not about the quantity of how many people you meet at the show that you actually can monetize and scale it's about the quality of people that the conversations who are really engaged and committed to moving forward. And I think that's the hardest part that you have to train your team on how to identify those people that are real versus not real. At SEMA, what we learned is that by having the right car or clickbait, that's what it is, it draws attention and attention draws a conversation that that person's walking by your booth and they normally would not see in your booth because there was nothing to draw their attention other than, you know, the spokes models that are working there. But the car is the reason that you really wanna draw them in and they wanna have questions. And it also builds credibility, because think about it. Who wants to talk to a company that has a, a Volkswagen bug in their booth and has a fantastic product? That's not really compelling for me to believe that your product is good when you have a Volkswagen bug versus if you have a Bagani parked. It's a totally different level of credibility. My biggest win from SEMA, I don't think it was just one win. I think it was a combination of different people or different relationships. I would say it helped us penetrate the UK market. It helped us penetrate Saudi Arabia, the free zone. It helped me penetrate Australia. So I would say it gave me more exposure to different markets with different types of people that were looking for solutions. And we had products that kind of fit the mold for what they were wanting to do. And I think the other thing that we've tried to kind of change the game a little bit is that we're more about teaching people how to sell the product okay and we're also teaching them how to teach other people how to get results and so we're really educating them on the business side more than the product side because without the marketing and the sales the chemicals don't matter we've done more of the business education with glossuniversity.com because it's a virtual online platform that teaches you not just how to use the product, how to PPF or code or paint correct. It teaches you how to do email campaigns. It teaches you sales process. It teaches you overcoming objections, right? And these are things that all businesses need, not just our automotive industry, but if you're able to apply it and kind of follow our business model based on our results and you can emulate that, then we guarantee if you're committed and you follow this consistently, you can grow the Glosser brand anywhere. Business to business has always been bigger because you're moving volume, right? You're moving pallets, you're not moving just single units. But I would say that we've put more attention to our Shopify store, which is Glosser.com, in the last two years because we knew in order to build more B2B, you have to have more B2C. And without B2C, nobody knows the B2B customers aren't interested, right? It's what the consumers want that makes people want to buy to the, from the B2B, right? You think about it. And we were doing it the opposite way. We were going after the B&B &B and not putting much attention to the BC. And then all of a sudden we hit a plateau and things weren't changing. And so our marketing team said, of course, things are not changing. The bigger the audience, the more sales. And the bigger the sales, the more demand on the B2B side. It's a B2B exercise because let's say you want to show open a Glossa.com store. It could be Glossa.uk. But you first have to show a U.S. business model on the training side, on the product side, the onboarding process for that to work in another country, for somebody else to be interested in saying, hey, I wanna be the exclusive distributor for Europe, or I wanna be the exclusive distributor for England. You gotta first show them the business model here is works like clockwork, like a fine-tuned car, in order for them to wanna to plug it in to their country. Because nobody wants to reinvent the wheel. They wanna know what your systems and processes are, and if they duplicate it and they follow your steps, they can get similar results. 
If you think about it, McDonald's makes a cheeseburger the same they do in Germany as they do Japan or in Australia. It's the same burger, it's a, it's a bun with a burger, with the pickles, with the cheese, with the hamburger. They keep their system consistent throughout. And so what we learned is by creating this educational platform, whether it's virtual or live boot camps, that we put together the whole business structure to make sure that you're successful. We keep going back to SEMA because we know the more hands we shake, the more money we're gonna make. So you think about it, relationships are the new currency. And when more people focus on the relationships and the value, the more people you can talk to, which is like SEMA, because think about it, you're getting 10,000 people sometimes an hour walking past your booth. That's a lot of exposure. And the more people you can have a conversation with, the more people you connect with, the more business you can generate. Buying a used car, especially sight unseen, can be a very scary process and you should never do that without getting the car inspected first. And the best and easiest way to have that done is using the Lemon Squad. They are an amazing resource that can almost immediately inspect a car for you anywhere in the country. They have no hidden fees, they're the largest company in the industry, and they have the fastest response times in the industry. So check them out now at the link in the description below. You can use the code VINWIKI for a 10% discount, and they will literally go tomorrow and check out any car in the country that you are looking to buy. It is the best way not only to find out if you're being scammed, find out if the car is a piece of garbage, and to make sure that you're buying exactly the car that you're looking for. So next time you buy a car, make sure to use the Lemon Squad.